Well, good morning to everyone and, and welcome and thank you for coming this morning for this very special seminar um, by Dr. Megan Lewis. We're gonna have a couple introductions. I'll, I'll give an introduction um, on, on Megan and some of the work that she's done and the accomplishments she's had over the years. I think one of the accomplishments she did was surviving working on the barley program <laughs> with, with me. I was just saying, I, I see one of our former technicians here. I was going to bring the other one back and we could relive short row harvest. It doesn't matter if you know that or not, but um, by that time of harvest, everybody hates everybody. So, um, but no, it was great to see Megan and all she's done. Um, right now, Megan serves as the Bear Crop Science Equipment and Automated Field Sensing Lead. In her role, she oversees the development, validation, global deployment, and logistics optimization of high-impact digital, digital tools and sensors. Meg is an award-winning scientific leader and STEM advocate. She has received multiple recognitions, including being named an American Association for the Advancement of Science, if an ambassador, Des Moines Business Records 40 Under 40, Seed World's 2022 Future Leader of the Seed Industry, and was recently appointed by the Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds to serve on the South Central Regional STEM Advisory Board. Megan is a STEM education outreach fanatic, ID and E, which is Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Advocate, serves as board member of the Science Center of Iowa and is a co-leader of her local 4-H Clover Kids chapter. I, th I think just seeing Megan, what she's done over the years and really her advocacy is really something I was always really impressed with especially advocating science for women of all ages, from girls all the way to adults. And it's just fantastic to see. And I think mentoring those individuals, because it's a completely different, you know, things that, that to have to handle. And I think they really need someone to talk to, and, and Megan's really been able to mentor them through those, those challenges. Megan holds a PhD in plant breeding and genetics from, North, from NDSU and an MS and B, BS degrees from the University of Minnesota. She re resides in Des Moines, Iowa with her husband and two daughters. I love this part. The Lewis family enjoys hiking, catching frogs. That's cool. Good for you. <laughs> Identifying insects, tumbling rocks, traveling and playing piano and NDSU football. So I know, Jane, you want to say a few words? I was going to say, I remember when Megan was thinking of coming to NDSU, Dr. Decker knew I was going to be down at the U of M for a meeting. And he asked if I could just meet with you, talk to you about some of the opportunities for, for grad school. I said, sure, I'll, I'll meet with her. And then I had just, you know, just talking with her. And you see the enthusiasm and the drive. And I was like, I got to find some money. <laughs> and hopefully she'll pick my product to come work on. And, and I'm so grateful you did. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rich. Well, as is often the case, um, thank you for finding the money, Rich, because um, that was a really important thing. Um, so I'm Jane Shu. I'm the, the Director of Special Initiatives for Agricultural Affairs at NDSU. And um, it is my pleasure to welcome you back, Megan, back home. Um, one of the things that I think is really important about who we are in North Dakota and who we are at NDSU particularly is here is a person who has, has done great work. And, and when you talk to her, um, you recognize that that all of that work is really rooted in the foundation of where she's from. Um, I knew Megan's dad very well um, in science fair and worked with him for many years, all the way back to the time that I was a graduate student at NDSU. And when I met Megan again this last summer, um, she was coming, coming through just to say hi to some friends. Um, she's like, Dr. Shu, I remember you. And that was really cool because you see the generation to generation to generation and how we're connected. I love the fact that here is a person who has just done wonderful things in her career so far as a very young professional still. And when she is on the, on the cover of an international journal, her first thing is, let's reach back to NDSU and say, hey, I would love to come and talk to your students. I don't have to be in the ballroom. I don't have to be on the big stage. I could come and talk to your students in class if you wanted me to. 
that's very impressive. And it, it just, it reflects all of the good things that I know about you, Megan. And we are just absolutely thrilled to have you here um, and ignite your spark, uplifting the next generation of leaders in agriculture. Please help me in welcoming our, our speaker, Megan Lewis. Wow, I have to give you a hug. <laughs> Wow, that was an amazing introduction. I'm done, they covered it perfectly. Now, I am really honored and excited to be here today. I see current bison, I see future bison, I see future leaders, I see future scientists, I see current scientists. We together make the world a better place. So just thank you for what you do and let's dive in and ignite your spark. So I think it's really important. Sometimes we get these speakers and we don't know who they are. And I threw in some surprise photos for some guests in the audience today, but it's really about where we grew up. And my roots are in North Dakota. I was grateful and lucky to grow up in my dad's science lab. And my mom and dad, both educators, community trailblazers, they taught me at a young age to make every interaction count. They taught me the impact that leaders and pillars can have on communities, not just locally, but worldwide. And for that, I'm grateful. A fun story, and I'm sure my brother will smile in the audience, but this probably changed me from a science perspective is when you swab a water fountain handle and you can look at all the beautiful colors on the Petri dish. Yes, it's wicked cool, it's science, but then, germaphobe Megan then you know arises so it gave me a good appreciation and understanding of science and that I'm grateful the fun thing about today is that I didn't always think that I was for sure going to go into science I wanted to do so much like many of you in the audience today I loved music I was an opera singer percussion piano I love science but at a point in my career I had to pause and say hey I want to give back to the farmers. I want to give back to where my roots were. And I want to give back to help feed the growing population. And then that was the decision that really launched my journey as a global agriculture leader. So just a quick overview. I just wanted to say, hey, go bison. I have a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. But I also have a degree, and most in the room know, in college education. I thought for sure I was going to be a professor. I was going to live in North Dakota my entire life, and I was going to be so happy. NDSU taught me to embrace the unknown. NDSU taught me to be adaptable, be flexible. I'm looking at one of the key leaders today, too, that taught me, hey, you need to step outside your comfort zone and go get it. And for that, I'm grateful. Saying yes to one activity outside my comfort zone every year. This was a big year, you know, from Corteva to Bayer. I'm grateful. It makes us stronger leaders, stronger scientists, and develops a broad knowledge set. So I just want to say that, yes, I was on the track to stay in North Dakota, be a professor, but I'm happy I took a chance. I'm happy that I went out to see the world, and I'm happy that I was able to bring my family, my coworkers, leaders, peers, mentors along with me, because that's critical. I would not be where I am today without the phenomenal support of Bear Crop Science leaders, mentors, employees, but also my NDSU support, my North Dakota support, and most importantly, my family support. So this is fun. You know, they said, hey, Megan, just tell us a quick, a quick journey analysis of your career. I said, oh, this is good. I needed to put this on a slide because it has been dynamic because I did choose to step outside my comfort zone and just to go get it. So these are fun photos I sprinkled in and this shows the journey of what I'm really grateful for. So yes, PhD plant breeding and genetics, I'm ready to conquer the world. I was so excited to start out as a soybean breeder in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I then transitioned really fast into a corn breeder position in Breckenridge, Minnesota. So if you know plant breeders, I'm gonna be real honest here, you know, after you get a PhD, we get excited. We're like, we're gonna conquer the world, we got this. My first day as a corn breeder, I showed up in my company vehicle. I was ready to make selections. I was ready to meet my team. And they handed me a broom. They, meaning my boss, my leader, and said, hey, go sweep the back room and come back in a couple of hours. Okay, at the time, let's be real. I was like, what? I'll 
Dr. Megan, you just handed me a broom. What are you doing? And it was the best two hours of my entire life. I swept the floor with contract workers from all over the world that knew agriculture and breeding better than I did. I was able to connect with them on a deep level. I was able to grow with them. And then that made us a stronger team. The secret to success is not about I, I, I. It's really about we. It's about how do you help your partner, your team get to the next level? How do you inspire them and elevate them? And most importantly, how do you champion them? And a full circle for that story, when um, our father passed away in unexpectedly in 2013, we shook thousands of hands. But I can tell you the hands that I remember shaking were those of the contract workers that swept the floor with me on day one in 2012. And so that just shows the power of servant leadership and the power of stepping outside your comfort zone, meeting new people and making every interaction count. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. So in 2013, I then got connected with, and they said, Megan, I'm a corn breeder. Can you drive me around sunflower fields? Now this was executives at Dow Acre Sciences at the time. Absolutely, but why are you having a corn breeder show you sunflower? I said, oh, what's going on? You know, I thought worst case scenario, like oh, I know I'm different. I'm a black sheep of breeders and scientists, but it turned out to be positive. Dow Acre Sciences saw that I had passion for people. In 2013, I began my people leadership journey. And that's where we relocated to Huron, South Dakota. The team and I built a multi-million dollar research facility from the ground up. I was a corn breeder, I was leading corn breeders. And then also I picked up winter nursery activities in Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Chile, and Mexico. Fantastic. The sites have been running. We connected with farmers. We have a testing footprint established, South Dakota. Fast forward four years, the family and I then relocated to Saged, Hungary. It's about two hours south of Budapest. This was a fun, again, step outside my comfort zone and saying yes. This is where I led research and commercial for corn and sunflower across Europe. And I met amazing individuals with amazing inspirational um, just goals. And that was awesome time. We get back stateside and then we announced da, 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 the merger. So Dow Acre Sciences and Pioneer, they merged together to form Corteva. I'm really grateful for my journey at Corteva. I have a lot of amazing mentors and leaders along the way. And this is where we relocated in Northern Iowa for a quick stint to help with merger activities. And then relocated to the headquarters of Corteva at that time in Des Moines, Iowa. And then this is where I, again, stepped out my side my comfort zone. So I was plant breeder, plant breeder, but in 2019, I chose crop protection. As a breeder, we sprayed stuff, but I didn't understand the end-to-end -end deployment and formulation of that. And so I chose to go be green and growing, go continuous learning, and this is where I dove into technology. This is the cool part. This is where people know Dr. Megan as dancing with Spot the Robot or drones. But most importantly, this is where I got to build out my global networks at a deeper level because it's all about the people. So I led global innovation for about three years. And then eventually I got into my, I, you know, this is a very, very, very awesome story because I was grateful for where, where I was at Corteva. It was fantastic. Look at the journey, six company relocations, lots of opportunities, not just siloed in science, but I could be a people leader. I was hungry for more. I was ready to be green and growing. I wanted to meet more people. I wanted to learn a new culture and I wasn't looking, but the right time, the right place. This amazing leader at Bayer Crop Science, who is now my leader today, he inspired me. I met him probably, oh, probably two years ago. And usually you're like, hey, not right time, not right place. And people can ignore you. But this higher up leader paused and said, you know what, Megan, you're going to change the world someday. And it just resonated with me. So when we connected, I knew it was the right time, the right place to make this big jump. And I'm happy I did because now I found a culture where I get to be me. I get to bring my best version to work every single day. And that's what we're going to find for all of you today is how do we find your strengths and elevate you and get you to the next level? So at Bayer Crop Science today, I'm an equipment and automated field sensing lead. And just really briefly, Rich described my role very well. So I'll just kind of highlight, it's really about the development, validation, and global deployment of high impact digital tools. That's my day job. I'm always a mom, I have two daughters. I'm really big on family. And then my night job is STEM outreach. And so just really thinking about how do we inspire our future generation to go get it 
and be their best versions. And so then the, my husband and I, we co-founded a STEM camp. I'm on the Science Center of Iowa board, and then also a co-leader of 4-H. That was a new one for me. We bring science in for five to eight-year-olds. Fun fact, if you have never been through a questioning with five and eight-year-olds after a science experiment, I think you need to. Because I did master's defense, I did PhD defense, and I can tell you the hardest question that I got was probably in April of 2022, when a five-year-old kept asking me, why, 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 why is this? Why, how does this work? It just makes you think at things at a deeper level. So I challenge all of you to really connect with our future generation because they are hungry for innovation and curiosity and they're ready to go get it. Um, some recent recognitions I'm really proud of and honored, Rich covered very well, but the fun one that just came up is now I get to take STEM to the next level by working with the governor of Iowa. And how can we make sure that STEM is considered across the state of Iowa in all school sizes, small and large, and also represent agriculture technology? Okay, so this is a fun team. I know a lot of them are tuning in from St. Louis today, so hello. And lots of them are tuning in from the Combine. Driving up uh, last night, this is a fun story again. I have many fun stories, we'll figure it out. But really, I, my husband is driving, let's be real. I was not driving. And I was just talking and working. And then all of a sudden I met with the South Dakota team and I said, hey, drop me your pin. And they dropped me the pin of where they were working because a lot of our team right now are out working long hours, hard hours, focus on safety and they're combining. So I was happy to see some of that in action last night. So I just wanna say thank you to the farmers and thank you to the scientists that weren't able to be here today because they are providing high quality data for us and they're making us do what we can do. So those are just some fun photos. And the Lewis hybrids, did you all catch that? I was at a production facility. Okay, no, there's some head shaking. I was at a production facility to the far left and I was so excited because I'm like, Lewis hybrids, my name's Megan Lewis. So it was pretty fun, I loved it. So NDSU asked me, hey, if you remember one thing from NDSU, now we're gonna start your journey. Enough about Megan, now we focus on all of you. If you could think of one thing that really resonated with you. And it was Dr. Richard Horsley. Yes, Rich, I'm calling you out. And, you know, as grad students, you have lots of highs and lows, and you're just trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. I'm still figuring out what I want to be when I grow up. We'll figure it out someday. But one thing that stuck with me is I used to use the word failure. And Rich, you might not remember this, but maybe you do. And I was in his office and he said, hey, you have to stop focusing on the word failure and start calling it unexpected result. And I loved it. It really just helped me think about failure differently. And this different mindset, putting positivity and energy boosting to learning was inspirational. So NDS asked, NDSU asked me to provide a quote. It's really about how do we focus and embrace unexpected results? And with that mindset, Thank you, Rich. I've been able to step outside my comfort zone, be adaptable, be flexible, not afraid to challenge the status quo, and just enjoy the journey. This is just a quick update. Sometimes photos are better than just words on a slide and just spoken. And th these are my two daughters. I don't know if there's a pointer. Maybe there is. These are my two daughters. They're my pride and joy. So really when my mom was on the big screen, they were so excited, CBS, Miranda Cosgrove. Let's be real, they were probably more excited to see Miranda Cosgrove, but they were like, hey, that's my mom and they loved it. And so this is to show who I am as a person that I don't lose my roots of where I am and I don't lose what's important to me. I did lose it for questioning, we can talk about it. I'm not perfect. My, my journey is not all rainbows, sprinkles and gumdrops. There was bumps, there was detours, but what I can say is that I always kept the drive and I persevered. And it was not easy. And I hope all of you can get inspired today to go activate your best version as well. And then the Dr. Megan statue is fun. Um, you know, this is, I, I was really excited. A fun story on Instagram. They're like, Megan, you're on the Washington Post. I was really excited. I'm looking all over and I'm like, my backside's on the Washington Post, but I'll take it. And so I took that as a win. Uh, the life size statue, if you are gonna be in Dallas, Texas, you can go see Dr. Megan's statue at the Arboretum. And it's gonna be there till de December 30th, I believe of this year. And it's a traveling exhibit. Okay, big rocks. 
I don't see too many pens and papers. That's okay. I have homework in, in these seminars, so this is fun. Big rocks. Big rocks are critical. I wish somebody, they asked me, what do you wish individuals would have told you early on? I wish individuals would have told me to focus on my big rocks and prioritize and make decisions off of those big rocks. And I'll tell you why. So as you're sitting on your table today, what are your big rocks? What are those non-negotiable solid pillars that you make decisions off of that you are not going to flex because this is core to who you are and what you do? Here are my four big rocks. Family, non-negotiable. And uh, I have this amazing employee that I work with. Hi, Monica. I know she's probably tuning in. And she helps me elevate and enhance this segment of my life to always ensure that work-life balance is a critical component on my calendar and everyday life. Egg innovation. I'm a learner. I love learning. I love the ability to think about how can we make our farmers more sustainable and productive? How do we protect our natural resources? And how do we enhance, embrace new technology and help our farmers do the same? Outreach, you probably picked up. Future generation, if we empower our children to unleash their creativity and innovation, our world and the communities that we live in are gonna be a better place. So that's super critical in my realm. And then global connectivity. So just really thinking about, I it's an energy booster to meet individuals from different countries, different areas, because they teach me something. It's really inspirational to hear diversity of thought because I love being challenged. My team knows this. If I'm not getting challenged, I will pause the meeting and say, challenge me, because I want the creativity and the safe space for people to be their best version. So now I ask all of you, what are your big rocks? And if you haven't thought about this, this is a really critical exercise because once you know your big rocks, you make decisions and you make decisions and I'll walk through some tips and tricks. And um, Anna Maria had me put this photo. This is stepping outside my comfort zone. And so this is not a photo that I would be comfortable going. This is from the Seed World magazine photo shoot. So thank you, Anna, for, for allowing me to step outside. But there's some really critical elements here. What I find, I've mentored over 300 individuals throughout my life. I mentor 45 currently today across the globe. And one thing that stands out is that we tend to get stuck in construction zones. And so we need to make sure that we're polishing our big rocks. We don't want our big rocks to crumble where we feel like we have to continually rebuild. We want our big rocks to be present. We want to live our big rocks so that we can polish, not rebuild. And your life, I know my life, my opinion, has changed for the better. And it just made me who I am today. Some fine tips and tricks, because everyone always likes, hey, do you have some Megan insight that you can provide? I have two cell phones. And I know that we've had this debate with some of my awesome Bayer colleagues on the table, but I have two phones, personal and professional. And I do this. I actually lock my professional phone in the garage in a plastic, not lock, but a plastic tote, just to show the divider of this is family time. This is where I focus on my family quality. And then this is work time. And then take it out at night and call India, China and just dive into more connections. But two phones have really helped me. Weekly calendar review. I review it and I don't review it just to say, hey, what do I have going on? I review it to make sure everything on my calendar lines up with my big rocks. And if it doesn't, I'm okay saying no. I said no last year, 363 times. And I'm pretty proud of that because before that, people that know me, I was so afraid to say no, but it's really good to focus on you and use your time wisely. I do focus time. So if you see my calendar internally, you'll see focus time. I do focus time because I need a chance to, to work <laughs> and not just be in meetings, but a chance to make sure that I think about what could be a chance to innovate, a chance to read, a chance to stay continuous learning. 120%. So as you think about it, I want all of you, and I'll, I'll call a brave champion to tell me your big rocks at the end. So everybody's now going to move their eyes to the floor. That's totally fine. Uh, but really think about your big rocks and how do you live them. And now the another thing is I always get asked about brand. What is your brand? And I love this quote because your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Your brand isn't what you're saying about me in front of my face today. Like, oh, she's energetic, she's smiley, but what are you gonna say about me as I exit the door? And so that's something that you have to really think about. <clears throat> this is the next fun activity, so Strength Finder. This is a fun one. So you have your big rocks. I see some people writing, awesome. And this helped me because I had to separate out at a point in my career, what do I love to do? 
What does the world need from me? How can I monetize my skills? And then what are my strengths? You know, my daughters love these diagrams. They're learning about them in school right now. But this really resonated with me because I did find some unbalance of, hey, do I have a good mixture, a good balance? And then am I thinking about things strategically? And am I setting myself up for success or am I setting myself up for burnout? Dead serious. So this is something that I always think about. And what are my strengths? And it's around your passion, your profession. What does the world need from me? My calling. I love people. Yes, I know I'm a scientist. I usually get called the black sheep of plant breeders, but I love people. Being around people is an energy booster. Helping people soar, seeing them just skyrocket past me is the true adrenaline booster. And then also thinking about you know, your passion, your mission, like what gets you up out of the morning? What are you so excited to do that you're not going to hit the snooze button, that you're going to go activate your best version and you're going to go get it. So this is something I want all of you to do is think about what are your balancing? Do you have your passion, mission, profession, and calling highlighted? Do you know what it is? And then is it balanced? So strengths are really important. When you think about strengths, um, you have to invest in yourself. This is a fun activity that I do. So now this is the interactive moment where you all get to answer and I get asked fun questions. But how many CTO and CEO positions exist in the company? Go. One, one, right? So one, you got to think about this. This is how I break it down with my mentees to understand what do they want to do? What activates them? What gets them excited and out of bed in the morning? And so there's one. So in a qualified candidate pool, how are you standing out students, future students, graduate students, professors? How are you standing out? Any bold volunteers? Because then the next question is, are you standing out for the right reasons based on where you wanna go in your journey? Your brand, is your brand aligned with your aspirations of where you wanna go? What are your top strengths? And most importantly, are you able to share your top strengths with me in 30 seconds? So that if you get anything out of today, I'm looking at all these bright students, is give Dr. Megan your 30-second elevator speech. And I really mean this. You never know who you're going to meet in the elevator. You never know who you're going to meet in the grocery store. You don't even know walking through the Memorial Union. I got to meet amazing Bayer colleagues from Canada. I was so excited, right? And you need to be sure that your message and your brand resonates when you have those interactions. So who's the bold volunteer? Who wants to share your top strengths, your introduction with me in 30 seconds? I do have a stopwatch, right? But that's a critical thing to think about. And I'm still working on mine because this is really important. This is about making every interaction account, especially if you go to the career fair and you're gonna meet industry professionals, we're gonna meet and shake thousands of hands, right? How are you standing out? How are you saying, besides the awesome NDSU gear, like I'm a bison, how are you standing out? And are you standing out for the right reason? So just really think about that. I won't call anybody out yet, but think about that and really practice and refine your intro that highlights your strengths, highlights your big rocks, tie it all together so that I know your mission, your vision, and your passion. That's a lot in 30 seconds, I know. So some strength finders. I thought that this is just uh, fun to put in here just to talk about where do you line up? And then I'm going to quiz you to see if you all can figure out where I line up. So we have strategic thinking, relationship building, executing, influencing. And these are some fun characteristics. Are you analytical? Are you futuristic? Are you positive? Are you relater? Are you adaptable? Are you achiever? Are you consistent? Are you deliberative? Are you an activator? Are you a commander? So looking at these four, does anybody feel confident? Like just show of hands, like where you think you line up on the graph? Are you strategic, influencer, executing, relationship building? One, two, and three, love it. You wanna laugh where I end up? In the middle. <laughs> and that's okay, right? Cause then you have to figure out, okay, so what strengths do I want to activate and bring as I build my brand, as I build my LinkedIn profile or social media or resume or CV, or just even work with my team and get to know my team? 
what do I want them to walk away and just know with? So then you'll have access to all this. So these are some fun words. So the students in the room, I put this up here. So when you're thinking of those buzzwords on top of your resume and CV, cheat sheet, cheat guide, put some of those in there. You know, are you a collaborator? Are you a relator? Are you a strategic thinker? Are you an adaptive communicator? Does anybody know what adaptive communication means? It means that you can talk to different stakeholders at different times in the day. So at 5 a.m. you talk to farmers, 7 a.m. you talk to investors, 9 a.m. you talk to a different leadership team, 10 a.m. you go talk to China colleagues. Who's able to change and tailor their communication appropriately to be successful in that situation? That is a critical skill set. Yes, the foundation, the background, understanding the science, understanding you know their basic requirements of English, writing, computer IT, et cetera. But if anything out of this presentation, is do you know how to communicate? Do you know how to network? Do you know how to mentor? How many of you have mentors today? Show of hands. See, awesome. I'd love to see everybody's hand, right? And what are your mentorship tricks? And my mentorship tricks is I have the rule of five. I refresh my five mentors every single year. Number one, I meet with a business CEO, somebody in finance that I don't speak their language. I don't know what they're talking about, but they help me stay critical to my big rock of meeting with family. Number two, I find a outreach trailblazer worldwide that keeps me connected to nonprofits. Number three, I, I actually mentor with my neighbor. My neighbor keeps me in the know of what's going on in our community. How can I provide? How can I be a better community trailblazer and neighbor and partner? I also mentor with my leader or two levels up, I think internally, and then global is really important to me. So I identify a different global leader every year. I do that because if we get stuck with the same mentors, do you think that we're growing? And if we are growing, what are those conversations entail? So just be really strategic with mentorship, make every interaction count. And here's some fun words that now you can add to your CV and resume. Next part about strengths. So I asked you about CTO. I asked you about what are your top strengths? No bold volunteers to come out and tell me your 30 second elevator speech, but that's okay. You'll tell me afterwards, I'm sure. And I'm excited to meet you. But this is critical too. Uh, sometimes I've had mentees come to me and say, hey, Megan, I, I know my strengths, but it's still not helping me. Like, is there another activity I can think about? We can all relate to projects. I'm not saying work projects. This could be a personal project. It could be a family project. You could be building a porch or a deck or something. But think about a project that you are so passionate and so excited about, a project that you thought was so successful and you want to hang your hat on. That's step one. Step two is now you think about what role on that project excited you and why. Were you the leader? Were you the doer? Were you the thinker? Were you the planner? My husband always jokes that I'm the architect and then he's the actual engineer. So then we always say that whether it's meal planning or cooking or building, um, it's always fun. I always have these great big ideas, but he's the executor and, and gets it done. And then how did you navigate challenges? I think one thing instead of failures, those unexpected results, what did you learn about yourself? Be humble. What did you learn about yourself? What are some of your areas, warning zones that you have to sharpen and make sure that they don't pop up and you don't want them to pop up again? And how did you activate any new skill sets? And this exercise I love doing. I know individuals are writing, they're thinking, it's in the morning, it's Friday, it's Bison Day, I get it. But just walk away. These are tools that I want you to go back and look at and really, truly do a self-reflection. Because if you do, then you're going to send me an email or reach out to me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Dr. Megan, social media, et cetera, and tell me what you got out of it and what I can do to help you on your journey. And then the most importantly, I added this one in here because sometimes in all the journals that I read, I'm a nerd. I love people leadership. I dive into psychology. That's one area I wish I would have learned at NDSU is I was in plant sciences, but I wish I would have taken more psychology courses because I think I deal with people on a daily basis more than I do with plant brain and science. And so that's a fun fact as well. But what would your team say about you? So often we get so excited about a project, it's successful. So often we push ourselves to say, who's the owner and who's accountable for that project? But it is so critical for all of us to pause and really ask, what would our team say about us? Was I a good leader? Was I a good collaborator? Did I network efficiently? Did I include everybody's thoughts? Did I think about diversity of thought? 
Did I champion those quiet individuals in the room or did I just let the loud ones take over the conversation? Did I make sure that I paused the conversation so that all voices could be heard? What techniques did I implement? And do a deep dive because being a good team member is what makes this whole thing go around. And if you think a project is successful because you solely did it, you are wrong. I guarantee you that yes, you had a critical part, you were a critical enabler and empowerer, but I guarantee you that you had an army behind you that made that project tick and make it successful. So I want all of you, if anything today, stop and thank your teams, stop and thank all of the people on your staff or even people in the dorm rooms. I don't know the age group over there, but think about how your friends help empower you and how they help you be a better version of yourself. And do not forget about the team element. So when you get through all this, why the project was excited, what strengths were activated, what did I navigate? Most importantly, top of your mountain, turn around, pull your team up with you and do a deep dive and a survey, even with your team, surveys are overused, but just talk with your team and say, hey, what would the team say about me? Kind of the in the mirror exercise. Okay, now the fun stuff. So this is number three. Don't worry, I have all your names. I have all your email addresses. I'm gonna ask how the homework assignment's going and you're gonna tell me and I'm excited to read all the answers. Very, my professor, you know, coming out in me but really about energy boosters and drainers. Everybody goes, Megan, how do you have so much energy? And I said, it's just who I am. I, I love it because I'm positive, I'm grateful. The experiences that I've been through have made me this way. Did I have confidence my entire life? No, and I know there's people in here that can say, no, I did not have confidence my entire life. But what I can say is that I took it as learning experiences every time I got those unexpected results to build into a stronger, individual and embrace who I really am. So just thinking about boosters and drainers, um, you know, what sparks joy? Like what gets you out of bed in the morning instead of hitting this news button? And what are some of those energy drainers? Let's be real. You're always going to have energy drainers in your entire life. They're not going away. You're going to have them. But the key here is how do you balance it? How do you make sure that you have enough boosters with your drainers and that you don't have more drainers than boosters? Because otherwise you're not gonna bring your best self to work. So thinking about drainers, this is really fun. What do you think is a drainer for me? You know me so well, we're like minute 45 into our great discussion and collaboration. What do you think is a drainer for me? Shout it out. Reports. Writing reports, what'd you say? Negativity, yes, yes, good answers. Sitting in Teams meetings for 14 hours in a row without any bio breaks. That is a true energy drainer for me. And especially when I take those meetings in a basement, in an office with no people around me, I love people and people interaction. So those are energy boosters for me. So what do I do? Um, grateful again, I have amazing leaders and employees at Bayer that just embrace me for who I am. And they go on these fun road trips with me. This past month, we traveled across North Dakota, in June, we did North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota. And then last month, we went to Mississippi. Like, how cool is that? We went to Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas to get to see the teams, the boots on the ground to say, hey, we value, value you and what you do, and thank you. And then also to feed my need to meet people and get inspired and get my energy reserve built back up. So what are your boosters and drainers? What's a booster for you? What gets you excited? Uh, meeting positive people, people. Meeting positive people. Absolutely. Think about mindset, how much it plays into your every day. I know I do a lot of reading, but think about it. If you wake up every day positive and grateful and you end the day positive and grateful, what do you think it does to your productivity? If you end the day negative, if you start the day negative, what does it do to your productivity? So find your balance, find who inspires you, who mentors you, who challenges you to go to the next level and hang on to that energy reserve, but be mindful of their energy reserve too. Because sometimes those people that boost you up, they're the ones that burn out too. So you never know what somebody is going through. So the big message here is always be kind. And um, that's something that I learned throughout the years that I'm still learning today. So what are some final thoughts? Uh, today, I was asked to talk about leadership, how NDSU helped frame my foundation, and I am truly grateful. I now embrace unexpected results. I have the confidence to go outside my comfort zone every single year. This year was a big year, but as I told you before, I did it with a smile on my face, 
because I have a strong supportive team. I have the opportunity to work with amazing, inspiring individuals, female leaders, male leaders who make the world go round and they're making me a better leader today. And so that I'm forever grateful. So I challenge all of you to be bold. Acknowledge your strengths. We did three options. Find one of those activities that works for you. Accept your fears. I have many fears, but you all didn't know that. I have many, many fears, but accept them. But most importantly, embrace mistakes. Don't view it as a mistake or failure, but view it as unexpected results. And what can you learn from that? Build your brand. I want to know your brand. I want you to generate awareness, achievable goals. I want you all to dream big. And not just for the students in the world, even the professors in the room. How are you staying fresh? How are you engaging with the next generation? Are you ready to deal with Generation XYZ? Do you know how they tick? Are you thinking about digital formatting? How are you tailoring your curriculum and your activities to help inspire those students to go get it and reach their dreams? You know, a fun article that was sent to me last night too, again, science and people leader nerd, but I read it, it was so fun. It's like the person of a workforce yesterday or in the past was about, you know, eight to five, sit in a chair, butt in the chair, what are you doing? You're just following status quo, you're just doing what you do to get a paycheck and then workforce of the future. You work anytime, you're flexible. We focus more on the impact, delivery of results and what are we contributing to the company? These thought processes can be applied to academia, my friends. And many universities are starting to embrace this and it's fun. It's fun to see because now we are helping build the future leaders of the world and that is exciting. So this is the importance of being adaptable and flexible and being able to embrace change Step outside your comfort zone. I guarantee you, because even my first interaction, um, I had so many acronyms uh, fly my way that I was, my daughters were telling me what they were. I was like reading a message. I'm like, IRL, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, in real life, mom. And then another one I got yesterday that's not appropriate, but I was just like, oh, what is this? Is it pita bread? And it does not mean pita bread, by the way, it's P-I-T-A. So I learned another one too. So we're all diving into acronyms. It's how do you adapt your communication style to really reach the audience and everybody at all levels. Then embrace mentorship. I want to challenge all of you to have your core three or five mentors, but then pay it back, pay it forward. You have a mentor, but who are you mentoring today? How many in the room are mentors? See, I would love to see all those hands up again because we all can be mentors. And that's some of the break down the silo thing is that a mentor doesn't have to be a prestigious doctor. A mentor doesn't have to be somebody that just was so successful in life. A mentor could be somebody that was going through something that we didn't even know. And they had the courage to embrace it and tell their story. A mentor could be somebody that inspires you because they activate different thinking skills in your head. So really think about mentorship. And then the most important thing that I tell my team, stay humble, stay hungry. Absolutely number one, practice mindfulness. This is a skill set that I've been actively <laughs> working on the last four years, active listening. I'm not doing a good job today because this is a seminar and they told me I had to talk for an hour. So please give me grace, but really active listening is not just listening with the intent to reply, but listening, taking that in, digesting, and then responding. When you active listen, you tell somebody, hey, I care about you. I care about your family. I care about your hobbies and what you do. Tell me more. And then your brain magically stores that information more when you actually take the time to pause and get to know individuals. So active listening is so critical. And one thing we didn't get to, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I, my journey is not all rainbows and gumdrops. Uh, ask for help when you need it. Mental health is real. Mental health is around us every single day. And I can tell you too, that it is so critical that you ask for help and you're not embarrassed to ask for help, that we're all going through something. And so feel free, know your resources, know your people that you can trust in and always ask for help when you need it because we're all human let's face it we're all human and we all have similar passions in some regard whether it's family or big rocks we have some ties of similarity but we're also different so make sure that you find those individuals that keep you honest keep you true and keep you going to the next level and then most importantly be grateful this is an exercise that i started about a year ago i have a journal it's amazon 595 it's called the grateful journal and so every day i wake up 
what do I do? The top five things. I date it. I read my ins inspirational quote. If you follow me on LinkedIn and Instagram, I love my quotes. And so I read the quote for the day. And then I write the top five things I'm grateful for. And then I put it away and I do it for the year. At the end of the year, I reflect. And I see if there's any trends, because I'm a scientist. <laughs> Are there any trends? Are there any aha moments or anything that I learned? But it's really, really important. So workforce of the future. I wanted to give a nugget. Again, some more fun words for all everybody in the audience to walk away and update their CV and resume with some really fun, flashy, industry-friendly words as you navigate the workforce. So this is Megan's opinion of what the workforce of the future looks like. Some core skill sets that as we embrace the new generations, the new way of thinking, the new way of working, how are we setting our students up for success and how are the students set up for success and how are you driving your career? Empathy, number one, hands down. Empathy, understanding the why, active listening, being there for the team, knowing what makes them tick, knowing what makes them upset and being there when things aren't okay, being a true empathetic leader. We covered advanced communication quiz. What's advanced communication? Being able to tailor your communication based on the audience and stakeholders that you deal with. You're going to laugh at this negotiation. I can't tell you how many times I negotiate on a daily basis. <laughs> and it's one skill set that you have to just think about. It could be negotiating for resources or headcount or funding or building out your team or thinking about the unknown. But negotiation is critical. Complex information processing creative thinking, technology forecasting. I'm not so worried about where we are today. I'm a forward thinker, futuristic thinker. Where are we gonna be in two, five, 10 years? So if you meet me on the road and you're saying, oh cool, I did this, I identified this marker at this place, blah, 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 that's great. How does it apply to the future? What are you gonna do to impact the world in two, five, 10 years? And then also metaverse, You know, whether it's Teams, Zoom, I mean, all these different digital platforms, how do you navigate that and how are you savvy with that? And then how are you learning every single day? And so that's what I have today. I just wanna say thank you again. I hope you have some good nuggets of insight to find your strengths, to think about how you're activating and preparing for the workforce of the future, how students are driving their career. But most importantly, I don't want you to lose the spark that makes you you. And you can ask questions. I did lose my spark, surprise, I did but I found it again and that I'm grateful because I have amazing leaders, mentors, coaches, and family support that makes me who I am. So thank you. When, you, when it comes to hiring, when it, when it comes to hiring, there's a lot, there's a lot of a long list of criteria. So where would you rank grades versus all the other criteria that you use for, <laughs> for hiring? Okay, so the question was, where do I rank grades or GPA? So you all are gonna laugh. Um, I even mentor kiddos of all ages and I'm even mentoring some high school students today. I tell them the first thing to do is delete it off your CV and resume. I say delete. And the reason why I say delete is because I'm not worried if you're a 4.0 student. Full transparency, Rich knows I'm 4.0 and I was always focused on grades. I thought that I had to have a 4.0 to be successful at life. And what I realized really fast, the first day being handed a broom, no, I need to really amplify other complex thinking skill sets. I need to activate my soft skills. I need to become a well-rounded, stronger leader. So my advice is delete the GPA. If I see it, I usually delete it off for the candidates. Um, but it's, in my opinion, it's not as important as all those experiences and activities that make you who you are. I also tell people... <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair, cover your ears, but cover letters. This is a good topic to talk about, cover letters, right? I think cover letters are a waste of time. I think that we're not utilizing our resources efficiently. And I think that a cover letter is just basically regurgitating everything that you have on your CV and resume. So I was a bold one. Um, Bear was the first one. I didn't submit a cover letter. I said, you know what? It's not me, it's not who I'm doing. And if they have questions, they can ask because I would love a conversation and a cup of coffee. Starbucks. Blonde Rose, to be exact. So um, cover letters are another thing. I think you have to gauge cover letters based on the audience, the needs, and the leader, the hiring manager, because some individuals truly need a cover letter. But start thinking futuristic. If you're going to do a cover letter, how does it stand out and how is it different? So it's not just saying what you already said in your 12-page CV or resume. She's standing by you. You nervous? Do, do, do. Great. Uh, while you're in college, what was the thing that motivated you the most? 
while I was in college, what motivated me the most? Rich is going to laugh. Uh, so I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I knew I wanted to be a leader. And I love doing a lot of the activities like counting seed and planting and harvest. But I knew with my mindset and how I strategically thought that I had to do more. So yes, I had to get exposure to those experiences, but I knew that I had to go on for advanced education and different education and learn new things because of what I wanted to get out of life. So that's a professional answer. But um, what I valued most was the question, what motivated me, honestly, was the people. I remember pulling in, because I started at NDSU, for my bachelor's and I was in Severinsen. Is that still around Severinsen Hall? Yeah, yeah, maybe. And what motivated me is that we were all there trying to explore life for the first time. And what was exciting is that not only I was trying to figure out who I was, they were trying to figure out who they were. And then you build those friendships and you build that network. And we may have gone different paths, different industries, but what motivated me is you had your cheerleading crowd, you had your champions, you had your advocate, and NDSU especially is like a family. That's one thing that stood out. I've been to other universities and I can tell you that here, professors, you're not just a number, you're a name. You know, it's kind of like having your NDSU mom, NDSU dad, it's real at NDSU. And so what motivated me was the people, the people that saw a light in me, that believed in me, that inspired me. You know, Brenda is over there, Decker, you know, just people that said, hey, even during my darkest days, um, you got this, but to always think outside too. So I would say what motivated me 100% was the people, but that's because it's who I am. I'm not gonna say uh, chemistry, organic chemistry, sitting in a lecture hall, squiggling little dots, because I have issues too with, you know, like multiple choice questions, like, oh, I could talk for days. So, um, but anyways, I um, it was about the people, it was the bigger thinking, the strategic thinking. I lived in the basement of Lofsgard Hall for the greater part of my entire education. And I made it a point to meet and get to know people and active listen. Garden level, excuse me. I call it the basement. So <laughs> I always tell my friends we went to the basement. Yes. Meg, I'm be like your daughter, real life, mom. <laughs> like it was great. You covered a lot of things there, but bring it to real life. Like your main rock, the big rock, the family and everything you've been through your life with your career. How do you balance your big rock, the family, yeah. like your homework, your husband dinners, and how do you balance all of that? So how do I balance? I will be humble. I was not perfect. I, I learned to balance because life. Life taught me. Sometimes we learn the best lessons by experiencing the hard things in life. And so when I started as a female in a male dominated industry, I thought that I had to walk and talk and, you know, be like everybody else in the room. And I had to work 80 hours a week. Is that sustainable? No. Uh, what took it, and then, you know, I kept piling on all these experiences, building a multi-million dollar research facility and just saying, I'm gonna be at the site 24 seven. Harvest crews, planting crews, I'm gonna be at the site 24 seven. I got to a point where I just finally broke because I said, whoa, things are unbalanced. I'm not getting enough family time. My family, I'm truly grateful, but experiencing some of those hardships in life too makes you realize that, you know, we can always get money back. It's gonna be hard, but money can get back. But the one thing that we cannot get back is time. So don't do what I did by working 80 hours a week, you know, trying to be the latest and greatest, find a new way that inflex it to make it work for you. And that means, you're going to have to be bold and courageous and challenge the status quo because there's many thinkers that think you have to be in from eight to five. There's many thinkers that you have to do it a very strategic boxed way. But I'm telling you that you could deliver those results and then some if you just embrace adapt, adaptive and flexible schedules and flexible thinking styles. So I was imperfect. I was unbalanced. Um, many situations, my foot got stuck in an irrigation ditch in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I was about seven, eight months pregnant. Guess what happened? I landed right on my stomach on top of my child. In the hospital, hearing that heartbeat was the most precious sound I could have heard at that time that everything was okay. But it just makes us realize like those hard moments build you to who you are. That's one example, you know, and just never take time for granted. And so I would say that a lot of those examples build me up to say, hey, this is non-negotiable. I'm a swim mom right now. Yes, I have my busy corporate life. 
and I have amazing colleagues and support network, but you'll find me at the pool almost every day of the week to cheer on my daughters to say, hey, go get it. And everybody knows my focus time on my calendar from 5 to 8 p.m. That's my time with my kids. So I balance, and I, I know this sounds probably really structured and OCD-ish, but I put it in my calendar too. Like, don't call me. <laughs> don't, don't. Well, I don't want to say that because if it's emergency, call me. But this is my focus time with my family. And this is where I'm going to dive into. So I'm not perfect. I'd say the lessons I learned made me stronger. But most importantly, I focus on it. I make decisions on it. And I'm actively thinking about how to make my biggest rock the biggest rock. And it's not easy. Now that the kids are getting older and now we're driving all over Des Moines, Iowa, but I'm only going to have nine years left with some of them, right? So then you have to think about time. Time you can't get back. So make the most of every moment. Yeah. Um, thank you, Megan, for this presentation. With this quote, you said, do not lo lose your, the spark that make you you. So how did you know um, that you lost your spark? Because at the end, you said, yeah, I lost my spark. But how did you know that you were losing that spark? And how did you find it back? Ooh, you guys are asking tough questions. Now I have to get real, real, real. I um, This was a scary day in my life. And I remember it vividly. I was pushing too hard. And I was in a 24 seven harvest operation, had six crews going. I was the one on call. It was a really wet season. You're probably gonna figure out what year. And we, I think I spent more time on the call with tow, tow truck companies to pull combines out of the mud than I did sending crews out. Well, what happened was I walked into the office, keep in mind, just go, 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 cover up. You know, my dad passed away in 2013. We moved, we moved, we moved. Four company relocations. I just kept go, 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 go. We are human, we all have a breaking point. I remember walking into the office that morning and I thought I was having a heart attack. I fell to the floor, things weren't clear. I got rushed to the emergency room. They thought I was having a heart attack, so I was chewing on baby, at, or baby Tylenol. And then they did all the x-rays and all the blood work and everything. And they found out that I had costochondritis, which is inflammation of the rib bone that um, is caused by stress. And that moment was not a heart attack, but it could have been, it kind of puts things in perspective. And so I didn't have my spark then, right? Who has their spark laid in the hospital trying to get tests done to figure out who you are? And that's where I really took control of my life about four years ago to say, hey, no, I can show people that we can do this the right way. We can do this where they can be their best version all day, any day and on their own terms. And this is where family non-negotiable. Like I, um, life is so precious. We have so many days. I just want to make sure we make every interaction count. So I lost my spark. I got really dark when I lost my spark, but then it was an effort to build it back up and build the courage and confidence just to go get it and inspire everybody else to not do what I did. Not to get burned out to the point of exhaustion and not to get burned out to the point where you lose who you are. And that's my biggest lesson is that that's why you need the champions, advocates. I survived out of that because I have an amazing family. I couldn't do what I do without my husband. He left his full-time job in 2012 to be a stay-at-home dad. And now he homeschools our kids today to make us more flexible so our kids can embrace STEM every day around them. And so I couldn't do what I do without a support network. So find your cheerleaders, find your champions, find your advocates and cling on to them because you're always gonna need them as you navigate life. All right, one last question coming from our online audience. Awesome presentation and points. Thank you. Question, Has you have you had um, either ignorant, pessimistic mentees or students that you've worked with? And if you have, um, how do you handle something like that? Thanks. Good question. Whew, you guys are giving those five-year-olds a run for their money. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so it usually happens when mentees got assigned to me early on where they didn't want to be there like, Megan, you're too bubbly. You're too enthusiastic. This cannot be real. Like, I don't have the time of day for you. And yes, that's fine. But what I did and what I can tell you, um, I, I did handle them and navigated differently. I found out what excited them. So yes, they, even though they're pessimistic and they, they are dark and they think differently and they just have a negative look on life in some cases, we all have that one thing that brings a smile to our face. It could be pizza. It could be macaroni and cheese. It could be ice cream. It could be coffee. So active listening is what I, act, I just active listen. And sometimes people just need a sounding board to, Hey, this is, this is what I'm going through. What advice do you have? So active listening is number one. 
Uh, number two, patience. I don't have patience. Uh, that's another skill set I'm trying to refine. People in the audience can shake their head that know me very well. I don't have patience. I'm working on it. But I did have to activate patience in this case because not everybody thinks like I do. Not everybody interacts the way that I do. And that's where I started diving into how do we have all voices heard? And so those experiences, I don't view them as negative because it helped me become a stronger leader to hear all diversity of thought and to hear all diversity of opinion and diversity of ways of interacting, communicating, and growing. We all have a different path. And I just took it as a learning experience more than anything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. And uh, I think testimony to what a great presentation this is. We're, we're seven minutes past and we've still got a full room. And I'm pretty sure those students that just left are going to be late for their next class, but um, heard some really good things. So let's thank Megan for an absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you.